So it is my pleasure to welcome Pro Professor Nebu Benvenuto uh, to the, the VMAP, uh, and uh, his title uh, slide is on the projector screen. And here, for those of you who don't know Professor Benvenuto, he's a short, short biography. Uh, Dr. Nebu Benvenuto received the Laureate degree from the University of Padova, Padova, Italy, and the PhD degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in 1976 in and 1983, respectively, both in electrical engineering. From 1983 to 1985, he was with AT&T Bell Laboratories in Home Bell, working on signal analysis problems. He spent the next three years alternating between the University of Padova, where he worked on communication systems research and Bell Labs, as a visiting professor. From 1987 to 1990, he was a member of the faculty of the University of Ancona. He was a member of the faculty of the University of El Quila from 1994 to 1995. Currently, he is a professor in the Electrical Engineering Department, University of Padova. His research interests include voice and data communication, digital radio and signal processing. So, Professor Benvenuto. Thank you very much for your introduction again. But I thank you very greatly for the coming to pick me up at the train station and the many other things. Well, the title of my talk is Pre-Equalization Techniques for TDD Multicarrier CDMA System. I, I split the presentation in two parts, although in the slides there is also one third part of it, which I think I'm not going to. Uh, I just mentioned it and I'm not going to get into it. So, the first topic I, I will cover is that I will uh, give a short overview of what we have been working on uh, pre equalization techniques for uplink uh, multi carrier CDMA systems. And I'll, I will present a, a simple single user pre equalization methods and then a more recent idea of pre equalization with uh, beta power of it. And um, I think that's the best. Well, I am not going you know, to um, debate here the issue of multi carrier CDMA versus you know, analogous form of modulation for CD for uh, 4G, and uh, so we leave it for maybe another topic. I just want to kind of mention here uh, to, to mention here the basic principle of multi carrier CDMA for I hope very few people who may don't know it. We, we take a stream of data symbols, obviously this most of the time are coded, but these are already a bit, you know, being mapped and uh, coded earlier on. So we have symbols and we have a spreading code, so each symbol is spread and uh, these spread chips are assigned to different uh, sub-channel of an OFDM carrier. So, for example, in the slides in front of us, we have the first symbol is in, in blue, we get a spreading code of length L, and in this case we have four sub-channels as the number of spreading uh, chips. It may not be always this uh, the case, but in this specific case, the, 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 the chip one is assigned to the subcarrier F1, F2, F2, and so on. In general, the spreading code is, is much shorter than the number of subcarrier, and we see later on why we want this. So, in this specific case, each data symbol will kind of uh, get their bandwidth, their own OFDM sub subcarriers. But if you have any questions, please me interrupt. But the antagonist, you know, a, another scheme, it may be 
it is uh, based on just the opposite principle. Each, the, each uh, data symbol is spread, spreading code is of the same length, but now the spread of chips are assigned to the same subcalibre. So, for example, the first symbol, the blue one, say the, you need out L OSDM symbol in order to transmit one symbol, the blue symbol. And now the different data symbol has, may be assigned to different sub subcalibre. But we are not going to cover this one. But just to tell you, the in between, you know, there's quite few variation for it. In this talk, I will stick to the uh, to the first mo modulation scheme, which is called multi-carrier CDMA. Somehow we have a standard CDMA where the spread of chips are assigned to different frequency of and OFDM modulation. Now, how do we go about detecting the, the data carried by a multi-carrier CDMA system? We have two major uh, approaches. We have a single user detection scheme, SUD, where the, the receiver you know, only knows the uh, the information, well, it doesn't know, let's say, does not know the information about other users rather than the user is trying to detect. Sometimes he may know the channel, other times he may not know the channel. Depends what kind of information we see. Another uh, very wide area then is multi user detection where the a receiver knows you know, about everything, about all the, the user channel also, also about the single spreading codes. Even here we have two uh, <coughs> subclasses, how we go about multi-user detection, the multi likelihood the maximum likelihood approach is very complicated in general, so we rely on two sub-optimal quasi optimal uh, method, one is interference, cancellation, the other is joint detection. Obviously everything is a trade off between performance and compressed. Now I will put the next slide will be a comparison among uh, a, a di di different scheme we may use at the, the the receiver point. So I want to kind of um, write down the channel we are we are uh, in mind here. The spreading code we are using is Wash Adamant. The spreading length for the most complicated runs are 64, very short. Otherwise, they're 64. Uh, they're 16, sorry, or they're 64. The channel code is a convolutional one. It's rate one half. The number of subcarriers is 16 of 64. The right uh, column number, not 64, 64, it are taken from the hyperland tool, the right custom. So now the OFDM has 64 sub uh, subcarriers, the cyclic surface length is 16, and the channel is a standard really fading channel with exponential power delay profile no uh, frequency offset, uh, no impairments are taken into account in these uh, runs. And we, when we need, we assume the channel is known. So, so the, can you go back to your logical figure? The, the spreading code, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the channel coding is prior to any combination of spreading yes. or whatever. Yes, the spreading uh, is done on the bit level. So we have uh, uh, bit information, then we have the uh, channel code, uh, then we have mapping, usually we use a QPSK here, right. and then we have spreading, and so on. Right. And, and the rarely fading of the different subcarriers? No, uh, the rarely fading is in the time. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's assume we have this set of numbers. They say we use a cyclic 
for the sake of length 16, yep. uh, so we stick to the uh, standard hyperland 2. Uh, roughly here, the um, RMS delay spread of the channel, which will give you kind of the, the duration, you know, the span of the channel length, is about two chips, I believe. You know, it's no more. And the than then it may. And it has an exponential profile. So you generate this channel instance? Uh -huh. And then from that, you determine the gain on each subcarrier? Exactly. On it depends on the algorithm that yeah. we are kind of going to uh, show. Okay. But anyway, the relay, the relay fading sorry, is in the time. Yeah. So we assume that the different types of the channel are, are independent with a different values. Okay. So just from the start, I want to show you how a easy, uh, a simple, rather than easy, uh, method performs. Let's start from the downlink. In the downlink, Usually, we are talking about base station broadcasting to uh, different users, all right? So, one, the, the user now is getting his information and also all other interference. Now, the interference is getting is going through the same channel that he says. Okay, that's a big difference. In uplink is that the base station now is getting all the... the messages sent by the mobile user, but each one is sending only a different channel. So this is the main difference between the uplink and downlink. We are talking single antenna here. Now, I just, you know, I want, uh, if you go through the tons of papers dealing with single user de 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 detection uh, algorithm, I just want to show to you that uh, interference, uh, if, if we try the zero forcing, but unfortunately here, I assume that most of you know kind of this uh, acronym. Actually, later I will show to you the algorithm, also the equation. But now I thought, you know, kind of skip a little bit of stuff. But uh, just I want to give you a, a, a rough idea how this algorithm works. Okay, then I start from the most complicated one. Minimum mean square per user. This is a green line. And I plot here the average bit error rate versus the number of users. So single user will be one and uh, 16 will be full load. This is a 16 uh, subcarrier point. Excuse me, is it uh, all the users are at equal rate? Yes. And uh, are they also distributed according to their pass loss or the no. just identical gain? Identical gain. Mm, so in the downlink, they have the same uh, transmitter power. So they have the same transmitter power and they're located at the same distance from the base state so that their pass loss is the same. Yeah, but, uh, yes. <coughs> so, this one, uh, the minimum is quite per user means the base station knows everything, well actually the mobile, sorry, knows everything. All the channel or possible user does the best it can do to get his own information. So, you need quite a bit of information and you need to, in order to find the best equalizer, you need to invert the matrix, which you know, has all possible information. But still, it is a linear system, right? And this is a curve. It's not very bad, you know. A full load is below 10 to minus 3. Now, we have also a slightly simpler, but it does mean that it still requires to know everything all the possible channel, all possible codes. But this one we equalize on a subcarrier basis. So before the this breath. The difference so here 
they will get some interference when we try to uh, de spread the information. So, so the interference is in the camera sense? No, in the user. Here we are talking in the user because the cyclic uh, prefix will remove all the inter-symbol interference. So the interference we are, we are talking now is just due to multiple users. No, uh, I am just not understanding why uh, the first one is, the second one is first and the first one now. The more because because this one you equalize per subcarrier, so on the chip level. The like you have a, C, a CDMA and you equalize on the chip level. And the other one is symbol level. So it's a big difference. So maybe here you equalize you know, too much the second channel and uh, maybe you emphasize too much the noise of the third the subcarrier and you know, oh boy, too late, right? So that's why, it, so you do not have a control on the global performance when you operate on so carry. But, obviously it's much simpler. Here is just a ratio of what you think. Here you have to invert the matrix in order to get the, the gain. Anyway, here now we have a plethora of other ideas. Let's start, you know, from the simplest one. Zero forcing means the equalizer tries to do the inverse of its own channel. Unfortunately, you know, you pop up the, the noise. But there's no interference. So it is the performance are independent on the number of users, depending on, on the signal to noise pressure. So, so, so wait, the way you did was you inverted the channel? Yes. On each okay. sub, so carrier, you invert. Exactly. Exactly. But okay. it, he doesn't pay uh, off, I mean, because, you know, the okay. performance are 10 to minus 2, so it's kind of still low. Okay, now, as you see here, we have to find a, a, a compromise between you know, a, um, equalization, try to, well, to equalize, sorry, to remove interference to, to other users and to collect the, the diversity of the different chips. Now, uh, so, ORC means for orthogonal restoring uh, criterion. So it is a zero forcing action. And here is a classic uh, equal gain combining. It. On each gain, you multiply by the opposite of the phase on each channel. And it is a maximum ratio combining. Unfortunately, you see the maximum ratio, ratio combining is doing very well with low interference in doing very bad. And that's actually what I wanted to ask. Why maximum ratio combining is really the worst? Because uh, the maximum ratio uh, combining is a kind of match filter, right? To, to your data. Yeah. And by, that is ignoring interference. Yeah, but the equal gain combining is even worse than that because equal gain combining combines even even irrespective of the channel. It just multi, as you just said, multiplies by the signal of this flipped phase. So uh, I, for me, it really comes as a surprise that maximum ratio combining loses to equal gain combining. But if you see later, okay, hold on, because this is right. right. just a, a review of all stuff. <laughs> I don't want to get kind of stuff that. But anyway, I want to kind of show you. Then uh, we also play a trick here, and somehow these are perturbation on the basic idea. <coughs> uh, for example, if you do zero forcing and try, you know, uh, and we do not equalize on certain subcarriers, especially when the amplitude is very low. So we put a threshold and we invert the subcarrier only when it has you know, an amplitude higher than such a threshold. And you can do really tremendous gain in performance. So, <coughs> um, so it doesn't take much you know, to understand where the problem is. It kind of takes a little bit. And you can improve quite a bit. Overhaul, you can see in, in downlink, but we are not doing very great when you know the full load, but we're not doing very bad, especially for voice application. 
in uplink, instead, the situation is, uh, is dramatic. I mean, the only, uh, uh, the only scheme which works is the minimum mean square per user, so you need to know everything. As you remember, the difference between downlink and uplink, in this case, you, here we have one channel for all, all users, let's say, here we have a different channel. So, we have to do something in uplink. But that's, I mean, the very well known. Many people say, well, we should not be using a CDMA, right? Uh, a a multi carry CDMA for uplink due to this kind of problem. So, we, we kind of uh, try to do better on this one. So, um, one idea now, the algorithm we just saw, they start when the problem already occurred at the receiver point, where most of the time it's too late. So, another area of uh, attacking this, this problem is to pre-equalize. Well, the, the pre-equalization, somebody called pre-coding, and you know, I rather don't use pre-coding because coding for me is a code, and this one instead is just gaining. So it's pre-equalize a problem, or pre-gaining something, but it's not a code. That is here. So the idea here then uh, when we spread the signal and we assign it to the different subcarrier, maybe I have a picture. Yes, yeah. The only difference with respect to the basic uh, scheme I showed early on is that we multiply each sub subcarrier by gain. The you know, we have to find you know what is the best gain in order to get the best performance at the, the, the receiver end. Again, similarly to the receiver end, we can have at the transmitter end information about ourselves or about everybody. So, we have single user pre-equalization, S-U-P-R-A, for when you actually assume you know only you, your channel. By the way, the difference here, with respect to the previous case, that even when we assume to know our own channel, you know, who is giving us this information? So, means here we have two uh, way, ways of, of going about, or you ask the base station to send you the take coefficient of your channel, which is crazy, or the simple way we assume that we have a TDD mode of transmission, where the the sender try to estimate the channel and you will be using that channel to transmit its own information. So, I mean, it's not much difference from before. But another nice idea in this environment, you know, that we may uh, we may want to perform only spreading at the receiver end. But this is an extreme case. You could you could also compromise to have some gains at the data transmitter and also some gain at the uh, receiver end. Although in this picture we also only have spreading. I have a quick question. So in the transmitter and each channel, each carrier has a fixed uh, chip rate, a fixed bit rate, a fixed information rate. You only fool around with the gains. Yes. In this environment, is that we assume the simplest case, each user, all users look alike. They have the same rate that and everything, same power, everything. So. Then things may change it later. So, I mean, okay, I mean, it's not much different with respect to the other case. And here, as uh, done at the receiver end, at the transmitter end, I use pseudo acronyms as we used before. Uh, um, maximum ratio combining with pre, no post but pre. Okay? So and we use as a K, uh, gain K the 
cultivate all the channel uh, gain of subcarrier A. There we have equal gain, the same with the better phase, the zero forcing, here called ORC, orthogonality, restoring, combining. Then we have, you know, the perturbation I was talking to you earlier on. We have the zero forcing, which is this one, but not on all subcarrier, only on those <coughs> whose magnitude is greater than a certain pressure. And we also have equal gain, kind of mix between equal gain and uh, uh, equal gain combining. Okay, but this uh, perturbation that I, I mentioned. So we need, unfortunately here we have now a new parameter to kind of find the pressure, you know, what is a good pressure? And we say, okay, invert the channel, or oh, don't do anything, right? Now, I just uh, I sort of lost track of one thing. You're doing both the spreading in time and in frequency? No, here, at this point, only in frequency. Only in frequency. Only frequency. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, uh, lately, by a couple, that's, that's not our hybrid. I, but it's very a power fiber, so I spend a few words about that. It's called pre I and S I and R base. So in this algorithm on each subcarrier we try to optimize the signal to noise ratio on each subcarrier. Now uh, here you will need you have a contribution of the interference, okay? So you have your signal, which is the gain of your sub subcarrier, and over the noise plus interference. Well, to know the interference, you should know everybody else. Well, in this paper, these people assume on the average, the interference I get is the interference I produce. All right? So they exchange the interference I get, well, I assume it's the same the interference I produce on the average. So you see here, I'm using my channel multiplied by the number of users. So on the average, long average, and this is the interference I'll be producing on the outside. May I ask a really dumb question? If there are 16 <coughs> users in the system, I see the interference from 15 users upon me. So it means that this interference should be roughly 15 times larger than my fault. So uh, then I'm missing the point how come that my interference is equal to what I am producing? I think it should be like 15 times larger than what yeah. I am producing. No, no, no. no. Oh, that's two minus one. one. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay. Uh, I don't know. All I of use these, big. though, have some normalization associated with keeping yeah. the power. The power. Yeah. 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 You are pretty good, right? <laughs> Here it comes. Also, we need, you know, to, to normalize the coefficient k in order to meet the power. <laughs> constraint. Here we, we have two approaches that you see around. One which says, I mean the most intuitive one, we scale k by one over you know, the, the square root of the sum of the values k. Alright, so we scale by the norm of the scale. The other uh, attitude that we can we may take is this one. We start from the the biggest k, and we assign it to the sub sub carrier, you know, p sub one, for example. Then we try to in, in, incorporate one k at a time up to our budget, and then we set all k's equal to zero. We realize that this one is introducing a lot of uh, interference, and okay. well, we have some kind of course. I don't want to get into detail because they're not very useful anyway, but uh, just to mention the, uh, the scaling does much better in general. So we uh, don't deal anymore with this issue. So now we have you know five or six uh, methods to find this case, and uh, we have also a normalization factors, so we are set. And now we compare the average beta rate versus a bit over and off. 
but probably what you like is a similar to what we had earlier on. Okay. Here is the average word versus the number of users. And uh, okay. As well, I mean, I just uh, this is a classical minimum square error per user, you know, our benchmark somehow, and these are the pre SNR based, doing very well. You, you, they, we should keep in mind that the pink line was everything, you know, the method was everything, this uh, blue line just not the number of users and your own channel. Big difference. But also the black line is doing uh, pretty well. So it is equal gain combining with some threshold on the gain. So if the threshold is below certain threshold, we kind of kill, if the case is below certain threshold, we kind of kill that gain. So this kind of uh, threshold idea uh, works pretty well. So all of your free schemes are all just doing some kind of MRC, uh, some linear combiner at the receiver? So, yeah. So the, the bottom scheme, right, the, the in pink. Yeah. So all of these the, schemes the, where you they localize at yeah. the receiver, you just do a... Spreading. The despreading. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. do despreading and that's, and, and that's it. That's it, yeah. And here is again the question, like if you can bring the uh, next slide. Um, yeah, I think another one. The, 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 yes, no. Um, okay. the previous, yes. So here the post MMSC per user, a large number of users is losing to pre, uh, pre oh, yeah. yeah. base. Exactly. Because um, the interference, you know, uh, is too late somehow. <coughs> so okay. you, if there are too much interference, that the best you can do is not a very good point. Okay, I see. So, so pre equalization is always better than post equalization. Oh, I, mean, I mean, that the high number of users pre, pre is better than post. Right. Also, from the classic, uh, from, from the textbook, you know, pre is always better than the post, right? Yeah, well, yeah, it's the best to have both pre and post. That's, that's right. right. But I I mean, mean, you're spending a lot of money there. Uh, these are for the highest and resume. This is eight, 18. Eight eight eight. Everyone operating at a low extent, then also with the nature of the class. Well, let me. Oh, sorry. Let me go. Here, we are here. Okay. Uh, well, in, in the low, you know, in the noise, when the noise, you know, is present, I mean, you know, so much you, you can do. I usually aim for 10 to my straight, that, that, that's why I, I was going toward the 18, so it's a good a compromise. So we are not, you know, 25 uh, over the over not where really it's just interference is taking place. Here we have a compromise between noise and interference. And as usual, you see the maximum ratio co combines it not doing well, this a full load because of, it, of interference and uh, the same kind of idea will be extraordinary. And here the post MMSC is the best. Oh, yes. Eight users. No. Uh, yeah. This one is eight users. Okay. Sorry, eight. They're not sustained. They're not a full load. Okay. But the mm, in general, you know, the post MFC, unless you have a full or closer to, to the full load, in our case, also being a good benchmark. And, uh, but, you know, with much less information, you can get a very close to it. And, and remember, the difference between these two, uh, these three lines, you know everything, you know just the number of users, which is information very kind of touch and here you just know your own channel so the difference and we kind of bring you almost an order of magnitude a little bit less okay this will conclude my first part so this we're kind of 
the single user with some kind of twist, you know, in the uh, algorithm. And mainly here we are selling pre-equalization, which is already kind of well-known uh, approach to overcome interference at the, the, at the server level. You have to, to remember that in our case, you know, with the cost, most of these algorithms were really saturating. Uh, now I want to show to you another approach which is called subband loading for pre-equalized uplink with the DMA CDMA system. Uh, I kind of introduce one more degree of freedom here. So far I, I've been spreading only frequency. Well, you know, as a general idea, we could do both spread a little bit in frequency and also a, a little bit in time. But keep in mind that all users are doing the same thing, okay? So we are not splitting the bandwidth among users. Everybody is using everything. All bandwidth, at all time slots. But we spread over both frequency and time. So for example here, for, for, for user one, that's the symbol, we have spread of two in frequency, and also spread of two in time. The next symbol green, the same, and so on and so forth. Or use, use the same pattern. So they overlap at the chip level in time and frequency. A small twist. Well, I mean, this picture just says what we just have been saying. Now, I want to do pre-equalization. Pre-equalization, just bear with me, it's the same as before. On each sub-channel, we want to multiply for a given gain, which is a complex number, magnitude, and phase. Phase is not a problem. We assume to know our channel, so this phase is the opposite of, of the phase of the frequency response at that sub-channel. Sub, sub now, we just left to optimize the gain, the amplitude on the uh, gain on that Another twist. So, besides the gain, we also want to optimize the modulation encoding scheme. And actually, for each spreading uh, pattern, now for each symbol, we allowed a different code and a different modulation scheme. As you remember, in Apple and Tool, we have various modes, I think seven modes, if I remember correctly. A mode is a combination of coding and a symbol, you know, go for a 2 gif scale, 4 gif scale, 16, I don't remember if it's 64 there. And then we have a code. So we have a different kind of uh, um, modes in relationship to the SNR. If on that Sub channel, virtual channel, we have a good SNR, we want to transmit a mode, you know, which needs a big SNR. So it means a code with, with a very uh, high rate or with a high modulation uh, symbols. So it's kind of usual. So now the degree of freedom, you know, are quite many. We want to pick for each. Uh, uh, symbol, the modulation, the coding, and the gain on the sub, sub channels in at the transmitter side. So the receiver just has to be spread on the given time and frequency pattern, I mean, very simple. And obviously, he has to know what kind of mode the transmitter has been using. Excuse me, are you using the block fading model for your channel? Like, uh, do you assume that the symbols are uncorrelated in time? No, at the, the beginning, channel? I assume, yes. Uh, I think I have one slide where there is no Doppler. So my channel is constant. Constant. And then it changes, you know, after a long time. And then I use Doppler. Okay, but there is a specific frequency, so there is some. If uh, a walking man. A, a walking, sorry, a, a, a car, no, 50 kilometers per hour. 
But first, let's stick to a standard um, static channel. But I just uh, want to record because here we are using a, a beta power loading hybrid, very classical beta power loading. For some of you who are not aware, what is a beta power loading? A uh, beta power loading uh, will refer to an OF DX game where again, now on each subcarrier, we assign the gain, means our uh, factor k, minus k, and we want to find the modulation encoding, the mode, which maximizes the total number of bits we assign for OFDL symbol, based on the power constraint, and uh, and that's it, I mean. and also quality the total bit error rate must be, you know, a certain number. Now, sorry? No, this is a, uh, I can choose on each subcarrier, but usually it's the same for all, you know, 10 to minus 7, I think, I assume here. Maybe it's too low in this experiment, but you can choose 10 to minus 3 for the application. I think let's see that um, we can pick this one ten to minus seven, which may be different on the, the different sub sub, sub But in our case, we choose the same. I, we didn't see in our application uh, why choosing a different uh, bit of a uh, target. Um, so let, let let's go over again because that's uh, the most uh, important uh, point because we are. Our algorithm is based on the classical bit uh, and power loading algorithm. So we want to, to maximize the number of information bits per Wasserian symbol. When we have a given number of modes, that means codes and constellations, and we have a power constraint. And on each subcarrier, we have a target of bit error rate. Uh, there are many hybrids kind of doing this kind of optimization. It's not very complicated. Okay, so we adapted this algorithm to our scheme. The idea being that we enforce a zero forcing algorithm on the spreading length. That's it. So let's go back again. So in our case, on each subband, and I call here subband the length of spreading frequency we are having, right? So here the spreading frequency will be two, two and two. Okay. Now on this subband, we we force zero forcing, so we invert this channel here, and we evaluate an equivalent SNR on on this block. So for each block now we have an equivalent SNR where we actually inverted the channel. But the gain the two subbands have may be different. Because then we run a bit of power loading on the equivalent SNR. Okay, let's do again because that's the the, uh, the only point I mean of, of interest is here. If we were to perform a zero forcing, and we actually you invert the channel on each sub channel, and you send it. Okay. Unfortunately, if this sub uh, this gain here is very small, one over this one is very big, so poor performance. In our case, I get an equivalent SNR. It means if this one is very small, the equivalent SNR is very small, right? So I get an SNR very small. Now I run a bit of power loading, and so it means here maybe I don't transmit anything on this subband. We're not sending any information because the bit of power loading will kill it. Will kill it. Actually not hit, but the old batch of stuff. And so it means you know, forget it. This run, you don't send any information here, you just send you know some bit over there. So you see the bit a power loading is telling me which subcarrier I have to kind of hit. 
So are you doing this to, to, to possess them by each user in some sort of narrow view way, or is it done as a global fit power loading? No, you only you need to know your own channel because you are doing zero forcing, and everybody is doing zero forcing. So it's doing zero forcing for you. Okay. Yes, exactly right. So every we are over now. Yeah. Because and is it really for this kind of uh, spreading of the data symbols, like in those? I mean, is it well, if, if you have the picture here, it's like you know, little blocks, right? Yeah. But but. Uh, and the earlier part of the talk was just so assuming they're doing work of Yes. Right. Well, why? I, I just very nice uh, to have also spread in time. And I'll tell you later, okay? Yeah. Because so, it, so, it, 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 so somehow the results sort of depend on which way you're... Exactly. Oh, yeah, definitely. But I have now a picture of the candle going to. But let's say in the um, limit case, I don't do spread in time, so I should... On spread, I do spread in frequency, yeah. for, for example, I back to the previous case, okay? E no F to the M, I mean, right? It's a single case. So, uh, um, what was just the assumption of the channel? Does it change from frequency to frequency, or is it a constant? No, 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 no. no. The, the channel is really fitting in time. So, I mean, so here you have, you know, the certain kind of e correlation of this equivalence bandwidth, right? That's very useful to me. Usually, no. A joint uh, sub carrier are very similar, and amplitude, you know, they change slowly. So this, the notion of coherence bandwidth. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, just too much. Okay. Uh, now, I mean, the equivalent SNR per sub band is very simple. It is a is the average of 1 over the SNR. I mean, it's very simple uh, to find out this stuff. So the beta power loading we are using is due to Krongo and very famous uh, paper. But we also we derive those our own. Okay. Mm. Now I anticipate what I will do next. And your question is, no. If I do spread it also in time and the channel changes, you know, I'm doing beta power loading here. And it means, you know, you are not being fair, right? So what I do, I increase my target SNR. It's like saying, well, my target is 10 to minus 7. Well, I say, you know, I, I get an SNR target to get 10 to minus 8, okay? So I have a margin there that if my channel changes, I have no problem of going over my target. So I kind of spend in advance. I didn't know what to do it otherwise. Okay. Now, uh, so this one now is a, mm, the cumulative uh, PDF over this channel. And this one, the average SNR of my channel. For example, here, I need a glass of two. I have um, spreading in frequency equal one. There's no spreading time, so means time spreading time is one. So. Uh, this is a bit a power loading with what? This is the classical OFDM. We can't do be better than this case, right? This is a single user using the old band. That's it. Unfortunately, just one user. If we want to allocate two users in such a channel, we need to, you know, an allocator telling me, you know, maybe now I use the first two frequency, you use the second frequency, and so on. So I need somebody else telling me, you know, which frequency I should use. So allocation is very important issue. Now, as I increase my, uh, my, my spreading, I do spreading two. Now, all users do spreading of two on in frequency. I, I kind of start to lose a little bit, but very little. I mean, here we can accommodate the most two users, still a very sort of small, I mean, it cannot be called multi-user system. But just to want to 
to show to you how you know our the other scheme we're doing this the, the SI NR you know the mean square error with spreading of two and it's a minimum square error at the very the, 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 the receiver end also with the beta power loading I mean you know we are doing better oh a little bit you know some percentage and we are doing better the, again we should recall that uh, the SNR need to know how many users in the system and the minimum square root is not the old system. So big difference of information you need to uh, acquire in order to use the other two systems. Now let's do um, obviously when if we increase our spreading in frequency and let's go to the limit, right? So we are spreading only frequency equal to the number of uh, subcarriers. I mean, that's the, the worst case because we have an equivalent SNR. The next, we are doing a zero forcing. So that's, you know, a really critical situation. And as a matter of fact, for 48 users, you know, in pink here, we are losing quite a bit. So, as you see, it's spreading only in frequency, you know, on the subband. I mean, uh, it's nice to be able to spread, you know, on a shorter subband as possible. So that's why if we want to accumulate many users, we have to spread it in time. While well, this also is simulation, tell me in time. In time, what's the problem? Doppler. Here. We have the Doppler present, and you know, if it, uh, the Doppler is due to a, to, to a car moving at 50 kilometers per hour, in this case it's not spreading in frequency, only spreading time. As you remember, I paid in advance, so actually I throw away bits here if the SNR is below a certain threshold. So it means, you know, when Spreading time is about 24, things start to really go bad for this kind of problem. So the compromise, it will be, you know, spread a little bit in time and a little bit in frequency. For example, for 16 users, you see uh, the spreading frequency 2 times 8 or 4, 4, 8, 2 or 61, so far. And as you realize, spreading only frequency, that's not the best. But only spreading time is not bad, you know, it is bad if it is strong offer. So you have to find a compromise. For 16, we are here, and for 48, we are here. Obviously, you know, bigger than you are uh, taking, I mean, uh, these things, loser in capacity. Are these all curves are really, really close to each other? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Then it depends, you know, if uh, you are going with a high SNR, everybody is going there because you have a, a full, uh, the, the maximum rate. It, somehow, if SNR is big enough, we are using the best code, the lowest rate code, and the highest, highest constellation. So everybody will get there almost. So the message here is that, uh, well, here, yeah, how we evaluate this margin, I don't want to think of it. Uh, I think uh, that this is it for the second point. I just mentioned only, only the, certain, the, the, the third point, uh, what people have been working about, and then uh, I close just one more minute. And we are using beamforming, and uh, we and many other people also in downlink. So, in order to simplify the mobile station, we want to kind of do pre-equalization also at the base station, which is the, the, the if you think is very hard problem because you know I can equalize one channel to you. But what about the, the next user, okay? So who's giving me this degree of freedom? Multiple antennas. 
So we have been working in this area of a kind of um, pre-equalization conjointly with MIMO system in a uh, multi-carrier CDMA system. Uh, well, I think I skip and go to the conclusion. Okay, uh, in my talk, I, I presented the first simple single user pre equalization techniques for multi carrier CDMA system, and then the more sophisticated and you know more performing hybrid based on uh, bit uh, power loading. Mm. also in a pre-equalization kind of uh, system. And I just briefly mentioned that we could also do pre-equalization in a multi-user environment in a downlink if we are using big form. If we conclude my talk, do you have any further questions? So any questions? Um, I have actually one. Uh, so here you will consider the single user pre equalization. Now, suppose that because it's the ED system and base station knows actually the channel response from all the users, can it do the cooperative pre equalization for all users at once? Would be any significant gain by doing so? Well, what is the thing you're asking? No. Is possible? The well, he, he does it for user. I mean, it's yeah. a single user pre equalization. So every time the he, 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 one user is being considered for pre, for pre equalization separately from the other. Now, if the transmitter, on the other hand, because you know, there are end channels involved in reality, even on the downlink. If you target, and I'm talking more, my question is more about the downlink actually, not the Yeah, the downlink is here. Uh, we buy the degree of freedom of uh, equalizing the multi user channel by multiple antennas. And the single antenna, can you do it also? I don't know where you, you get the degree of freedom, you know, because if I equalize you, I mean, there's something problem. Yeah, the that's, that, that's what I'm saying. Then single user pre equalization probably wouldn't work. But because base station knows all the channel responses, it can actually do the equaliz pre equalization, yeah, taking into account the fact that if I tweak a little bit with one user, it will affect the other exactly. user as well. So therefore, I can find a kind of a uh, codes or a spreading sequences which are the best for this collection of users and for their collection of channels. Usually, three... Sorry, sorry, sorry. You don't have it. But you don't see it, I, no. I, it was too difficult, I probably. I, I don't think it has a so, solution because you do not have the degree of freedom. Because, uh, at least in, in a linear people, I, I don't know, you know, to say... I, I, I need a proof to say something. Um, well, the degrees of freedom are the same if you, you, you have No, the, uh, because here in our linear scheme you only have the coefficient for sub channels, right? So you have n numbers and you try to equalize m channels and the, the, yeah, right. m users and the yeah. number of users is always smaller than the number of channels so you sort of can do it. You, you could play around on, on, on the relationship between the the degree of freedom, well, the length of your channel and the number of users, yes, yes means that because of your frequency. Yes. So it's you can play a little bit. Since you're already doing the two dimensional spreading both in time and frequency, actually, the number of sequences to play with is actually quite large. It's a product of your number of your. Uh, no, well, no, no, no. Or in yeah. my case, the coefficients are per sub carrier, they do not change in time. They don't change. No, I, I just otherwise, you know, would be too messy. Mm -hmm. well, pre coding can be done, like, you know, to, you, you can think of that for every symbol, well, you also change. For writing uh, an equation, you can do many things. Yeah, but then in practice, <laughs> probably some <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. Then just to invert, you know, some of the messages. Yeah, for it's example, it's the minimum square. No, so my, my question, the, re the reason why I ask that, because this, uh, I mean, the comprehensive, when you try to, let's say, do equalization for entire thing, a lot of single user basis sort of sets up a upper bound. 
And if, for example, your single user technique already comes, let's say, within one dB of this up above, then you can say, okay, all this complexity for doing everything at once is not really worshiping anything because if already this suboptimal scheme is already closed enough. So you actually put the notion of test. You said, oh, we can do the test. Well, I think in his notation, best means you have a single weight and you minimize the meter of the EB of the No, uh, I minimize, I, no, I maximize the array you, yeah, you you for a given power here. Yeah, yeah. I, I maximize the array. You could do the, the kind of opposite to minimize the power for, for a given uh, rate. Would you? But then to get to the bound, you need to adaptively change in time also. You yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the bound, you have to do everything. Rate. Exactly. Which will, which will result in very high complexity, I guess. Well, oh, yeah, definitely. But that's why you need the bound. Bound is maximum you can reach. And then you take any practical like scheme and just see, is any room to really fight for? If you're already close enough, then you just stop there. Are the games good enough that um, we ought to really see the emergence of the because it has trouble to get to any and TV is what you need to do with that. Yes. So yeah. So are we I, but I think you know, uh, we were just made, uh, talking to like for my understanding, the big issue here is the allocator. It's not the physical here. <laughs> so how much you have to spend to allocate users with given band. So the Mac layer um, should kind of come in and you know and say how much overhead for each of all the different schemes. I am talking of of uh, for example multi carrier CDMA against OFD MA. Yeah. So we will mentioned today they are similar in the capacity well, in my previous talk, talk I gave, they were killing me on this algorithm. They were no, they, they didn't like much multi carrier CDMA because he, he, we are tolerating interference here. So we are accepting a little bit of interference, right? Sure. Well, they prefer to have a system clean, you know, not interference. And the third approach, for example, you know, is much cleaner approach with this respect. Each user has certain bandwidth and, you know, you can go. But then we have to see, you know, I claim, but I, I'm not an expert, approaching you know, the upper level. Maybe the access here is simple, you know. Each user sees the channel the same way and you have some seat to well, set. people would very much fight for one of that. Yeah, no, exactly. They, I they mean, would always say, no, no. Exactly. The sell their system and uh, the access is very simple or efficient. Or yeah, but that's why, I think, mean, in this place, they are talking is that you analyze Hyperland 2. With the sure, they control the 11A. Uh, oh, it's Hyperland 2. Uh, well. Oh, not, not from, from the Mac layer, yes. Yeah. From, from the physical area, yes, not from Mac layer. Yeah, I think that's a VLAB stage firm by the assertion that in DOS 11A, the proof throughput is far shorter than 54 megabits per second. I think Ivan's number is something like 22, 24. Yeah. And that's probably comes from the MAC deficiencies. So physical layer indeed performs a 54 megabit per second, but because of the map, map swallows up a couple of it. So how are we going to fill up this kind of gap, you know? Because we have kind of many equivalents in one system and another one. So I, to tell you the truth, I like a lot of <laughs> Oh, actually, DMA. So I, uh, I am not against the flaring approach. Actually, I like, I like it very much. So, but um, apparently, you know, from above, it seems they need to allocate, you know, timing more precisely, and see maybe if there's some offset. And besides interference, they don't know how to handle, you know, it. But by saying interference, you know, interference for them. 
Yeah, but yeah. also if, if they cannot do hopping in the, in the frequency. But I don't know much about the system, I just have a kind of vague idea. But being interference free means it's only, uh, they only can cancel the intracell interference. They cannot cancel. No, they don't cancel. I don't so the interference from the other cells is still there. And I think it's like roughly 50% of total interference is from the other cells. Yeah, but even at this point, some people argue about this, you know, because it depends on, on the past attenuation and the kind of stuff. In our case, it seems it's much less. Much less? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We kind of run a simulation of the whole system based on the cell, you know, on the cell and cell. And also use other schemes rather than only MC, CDMA and uh, the interference from outer cell is uh, very, very small. Very small? So it's not really impacting. So going going to a kind of, you know, free inter cell interference maybe is not a bad idea. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And, uh,